The United States men's national team has been disappointing to say the least. When I was a young lad playing for my school's club, I remember vividly watching every match the US men's national team played in the 2010 World Cup. Drawing with England was the highlight of the tournament, uh, maybe the decade. <laughs> but sadly, in the round of 16, the US was knocked out by Ghana, a team that many have argued that the United States should have put up more of a fight against. Four long years later, the US had another good start, only losing in the group stage to World Cup winners Germany. But in the round of 16, the United States men's national team lost to Belgium. Aside from Tim Howard's historic day, the US was completely outclassed. This is sort of how the story goes with the US men's national team. We hear of this promise of how great this team could be. And when it comes to actually fulfilling the promise, this team is a constant letdown. A more recent example, the home team of the 2024 Copa America, for some reason, and one of the most talented US teams to take the pitch, cannot make it out of the group stage. If the talent is there like all the US media is rabbiting on about, then what is the problem? Why is the US men's national team not competitive in tournaments? The country has a massive population, state-of-the-art training facilities, infrastructure, and a fandom begging for improvement. The only issue has to be the nation's league, right? Well, kind of. Many of the footballers on the US men's national team play overseas and are not just bench warmers, but actual impacts on their clubs. Guys like Anthony Robinson and Haji Wright. The reason why the team seemingly never improves then can only be placed on the board and the managers. Well, if you take a look at the history of who has managed the US men's national team, you might laugh. Almost every single manager for the US comes out of the highly competitive top division in the world, the MLS. As a side note, a lot of the managers also coached or went to the same college, Cornell, which I find really puzzling. Either way, it's pretty clear politics play a role in everything. And the most recent political decision, the rehiring of Greg Berhalter, who was blackmailed and bullied into playing Gio Reyna before he was ready to be part of the first team. Just as all US fans cheered when Berhalter was sacked for the second time, I'm sure many of those fans had the same feeling as me. Who will be the next MLS manager to come along and ruin our next World Cup? Mauricio Pochettino? Wait, let me get this right. The board hired a manager who led multiple clubs in the Premier League, including a Champions League final appearance? A manager who has experience at the highest levels of football? Did the USSF actually make a good decision for once? In this video, I'll be taking a look at the US men's national team's new manager, doing a bit of reflecting on how truly terrible it has been to be a US fan, as well as speculating about the future. If you like this video, consider joining a group of bucks who would save you from a car fire and subscribe to the channel. Without further ado, let's jump right into it. Before we do a deep dive into Pochettino, I want to take a brief look at the nine previous managers of the US men's national team since I have been alive. Every single manager, save for one, Jurgen Klinsmann, was hired from the MLS to manage the team. Yes, some of those hires were interim managers, so it makes sense that some of the nine come from the domestic league. But at this point, do we really think our domestic league is anywhere remotely competitive in terms of tactics with other leagues? I would take managers from lower divisions in European leagues rather than continue to spin the wheels on MLS managing the national team. With all that being said, this is a big hire. Because while Klinsmann, the only manager who wasn't based in the MLS in the past 30 years, has experience with the German national team, as well as managing Bayern Munich for a couple of years at that point. He had managerial experience for just four years. And if you see his track record, he was clearly not the guy. Pochettino, however, has true top-level experience. 
Before Pochettino became the coach we know today, he was one heck of a player. Picture this, a no-nonsense center back who'd make strikers think twice about coming near him. That was Pochettino. He started out with Newell's old boys in Argentina, where he caught the eye of a certain Marcelo Bielsa. Ring any bells? Yep, the same Bielsa who'd later become known as El Loco and influence a whole generation of coaching, including Poch himself. Pochettino's playing career took him to Europe, where he became a rock in Espanol's defense. He even helped them win the Copa del Rey in 2000, their first in 60 years. Not too shabby, right? He also had stints with PSG and Bordeaux before heading back to Espanol for a final hurrah. Oh, and let's not forget, he played for Argentina too, even featuring in the 2002 World Cup. Maurizio Pochettino's managerial career kicked off at Espanol in 2009, and it was clear from the start that he was something special. Despite inheriting a team struggling near the relegation zone and facing significant financial constraints, Pochettino worked wonders. He quickly implemented his high-pressing, fast-paced style of play that would become his trademark, leading Espanyol to a comfortable mid-table finish. Over the next three seasons, he consistently kept Espanyol competitive in La Liga, often punching above their weight against more financially robust clubs. It was during this time that Pochettino began to build his reputation of a nurturer of young talent, giving opportunities to academy graduates and molding them into first-team regulars. His work at Espanol laid the foundation for the managerial philosophy that would define his career. In 2013, Pochettino took on a new challenge, moving to the English Premier League to manage Southampton. It was here that he really began to turn heads in the football world. In just a season and a half, he transformed Southampton from relegation candidates into one of the most exciting clubs in the league. Under his guidance, Southampton had their highest finish in the Premier League era, ending the 2013-14 season in 8th place. But it wasn't just the results that impressed. It was the style of play. Pochettino Southampton played a brand of football that was high energy, pressing from the front and tactically sophisticated. He also continued his knack for developing young talent, nurturing players like Adam Lallana, Luke Shaw, and Jay Rodriguez into England internationals. His work at Southampton didn't go unnoticed, and soon one of England's biggest clubs came calling. Pochettino's time at Tottenham Hotspur was nothing short of revolutionary. He took a club that had been struggling to break into the top four and transformed them into genuine title contenders, all while working with a relatively modest budget compared to their rivals. Under Pochettino, Spurs achieved four consecutive top four finishes from 2015-16 to 2018-19, including a second place finish in 2016-17, their highest ever in the Premier League era. Perhaps his crowning achievement at Spurs was guiding their club to their first ever UEFA Champions League final in 2019. A remarkable feat, given the financial disparity between Tottenham and Europe's elite clubs. But Pochettino's impact at Spurs went beyond just results. He oversaw the development of Harry Kane from a promising youngster into one of the world's best strikers. He nurtured young talent like Dele Alli, Eric Dyer, and Harry Winks, turning them into key players for both club and country. Pochettino also managed the challenging transition as the club moved from White Hart Lane to their new state-of-the-art stadium, maintaining their club's competitive edge despite the disruption. Throughout his tenure, Tottenham consistently outperformed clubs with much higher wage bills and transfer budgets, playing a style of football that was widely praised for its intensity, tactical flexibility, and emphasis on youth development. Pochettino's time in Tottenham's history is referred to as their golden era. After his departure from Spurs, Pochettino took on a new challenge at Paris Saint-Germain. While his stint in Paris was relatively short, lasting just 18 months, it was marked by significant success. He led PSG to victory in the Coup de France in 2021, securing his first major trophy as a manager. 
This was followed by clinching the Ligue 1 title and the Trophy des Champions in 2022. Although the coveted Champions League trophy remained elusive, Pochettino's time at PSG added three significant titles to his managerial resume, silencing critics who had previously pointed to the lack of silverware. Pochettino's next stop was Stamford Bridge, where he faced perhaps his most challenging managerial task yet. To be honest, this is a completely different video entirely, but the TLDR, he took over the team in a transition with a bloated squad and a club culture in flux following a change in ownership. Despite these challenges, Pochettino's impact was still felt. He worked tirelessly on rebuilding the team's identity, focusing on integrating young talents into the first team, a hallmark of his managerial approach. While his time at Chelsea was brief and didn't yield the immediate results many had hoped for, which is kind of crazy, patience is a thing, Pochettino maintained his reputation as a top-tier manager, with many acknowledging the difficult circumstances he faced. That brings us to where we are now. The U.S. men's national team seems to have something that they haven't ever had, a truly competent and successful manager of some of the biggest clubs in the world. So what can we expect from the U.S. team going forward under Pochettino? I spoke about it briefly when delving into Poch's history, but I want to summarize his coaching style and what we can expect tactically. Mauricio Pochettino is known for his commitment to a high-pressing, attacking style of football. He often sets his clubs up in a 4-2-3-1 formation, emphasizing building play from the back while using an aggressive press to unsettle opponents. His tactical approach revolves around quick ball movement, working the ball into the box, and maintaining high intensity throughout matches. In addition to his tactical strengths, Pochettino is admired for his man management skills. Players often credit him for his personal approach, noting how he encourages them to take ownership of their development while helping them improve physically, technically, and mentally. His ability to mentor and guide players both on and off the pitch has earned him widespread respect in the football world. He's widely praised for his willingness to give young talent a chance, and many of the players he nurtured have gone on to play for their national teams. At Tottenham, several young English players under his guidance earned call-ups to the national squad. Pochettino has spoken about feeling a responsibility to help develop local talent, viewing it as a way to give back to the country that embraced him, particularly England, where he felt deep gratitude for the opportunities he received. Now, he's managing at the international level, and I'm very encouraged to have such a well-respected manager finally take over a team that has good talent, but has never used it properly. FIFA ranks the U.S. men's national team as the 16th best team in the world. They were 11th until their absolute dismal exit in the Copa America this past summer. So, even without any true direction from the previous skipper, the team managed to be ranked as high as 11th in the entire world. Now, I'm not saying I expect to go out and win the World Cup, but at this point, there are two years to adopt the new culture Pochettino will instill. It would not be crazy at all to view the US men's national team as legitimate contenders for a World Cup. This is a stark departure from my entire life as a fan of the nation and one that excites me so, so much. I can envision a lot of younger players will get an opportunity and it will be nice to see the team truly build out of the backfield and care about holding on to the ball. Another fun thing to see will be the counter pressing aspect and specifically how he used the number nine position. We don't have a Harry Kane because, well, not many nations do, but it will be interesting to see who benefits most from this system. I can daydream all day about what can happen, but we need to see it first. These players have to buy in, but I think if anyone can turn this team around, it could be Pochettino. The future does seem bright, even if it's just because the soccer federation made the right decision. Even if it doesn't work right away, if we have enough patience, unlike Chelsea, to allow the culture to shift, then I think the U.S. men's national team will be legitimate World Cup challengers.